may I request Mr. Justice M. M. Mateen to uh, come on stage. Uh, whose conception gave birth to uh, this organization. Uh, and secondly, for inviting me to have this privilege of becoming the third lecturer on this platform. Uh, I thank the illustrious judges, bright and brilliant present here, both of the appellate division and the high court division, and my uh, esteemed brother, Justice Amirul Kabir Choudhury, whose name I gave as one of the judges whom I like most, who is also a retired judge like me. I belong to this profession for more than 30 years. Off the bar, no, on the, off the bench and more than 17 years on the bench. So I belong to the profession which has been defined as a profession consisting of members of the bar, both on the bench and off the bench. So I am very much a member, still a member of this profession. Now what is the profession? So profession has been defined by no less a person than uh, Mr. Rasko Pound. Rasko Pound, you know, is the most cited and uh, illustrious legal scholar of 20th century. And he was the dean of the Harvard School of Law for many years. And what he is more known as a legal thinker and philosopher. He defined, and you know, for any definition, we, we take resort to Mr. Pound. He defined profession as a group of people pursuing a learned art in, in the spirit of public interest, public service. So he, he gives emphasis on art, balloon expedition, and storm came, and they were driving away from their locations, unknown location. And they were just at a, uh, in a confusion as to where they were. And suddenly they uh, located a, a gentleman walking down on the, in the ground. And they said, hello, gentlemen. No, it was a gentle lady. I, I, I forgot. The gentle lady, where we are? And the lady replied, you are in a balloon 25 kilometer above. Of the two friends, they were ballooning. They one said, she must be a lawyer. The other one said, how come? How do you know that she is a lawyer? Because, he said, because her answer is very accurate, precise, but absolutely of no use. <laughs> so generally, this is the view of lawyers. They are only feathering their own nest, and they are making money, etc., etc. The gentleman, who is Hitler, Adolf Hitler, he is the representative of all dictators on earth. And he said, it is shameful to be a lawyer. Mr. Knight gave the, this quotation at the top of one article, a barn is born. A bar is born. In, at the top, the, this definition is there, quotation is there. He says, it is shameful to be a lawyer. Anyway, we shall shortly see whether it is shameful or it is it is a it is a it a boon for the civilization to be a lawyer. Now, the other part of this subject is law, which is a very difficult subject, and we don't know what is the. I did not know what is the origin of this word law. Only few years back, when I was reading the short history of England, the G. M. McCullough's book that is a very very famous book on history of England. He says Lord is a word, it is, it, it, the origin is a Danish, Danish word. The Danish people invented some part of England that the word is located as coming from Latin. So I corrected myself saying, no, it is Danish. Now, this law has been defined by many scholars 
in different way. Before defining it, let me tell you two situations or two stories. One story of giving birth to two ideas. There was a city state in, in the Greece, the earlier degrees of antiquity, and it is Thebes or Thebes. And you know the a famous drama, Antigone, by Thephocles, Thephocles of the fifth century BC, before Christ. And in the book, two propositions are presented, or two situations. And after the death of Oedipus, the gentleman named, uh, what is called, uh, uh, the, the king, he usurped the throne and he hired one son to his camp to perpetuate his rule and another son took shelter in the neighboring country to wage war against his own city-state, Thibes, to dislodge this man. And Antigone was the daughter of Oedipus. Now, the king, he arranged a, a fight, a border fight. It was his innovation. And in the fight, the son who remained with him, he died. And the state arranged a very honorable burial for the son who died for the cause of the city, defending it from the onslaught of the other son who is on the other side of the border and arranging a fight against the country. Soon after, the other son also died in a, in a battle against the own city and the dead body was captured by, uh, by the king's soldiers. Now, now the king, he ordered that there shall be no burial to this dead body as a punishment to, to remind the people or citizens that in future nobody uh, becomes a rebel against the state. Now it is, a, it is a law because it comes from the sovereign, not to give burial. Now the daughter, Antigone, she, she declared, no, I shall give my brother a burial, although he is a traitor, because the law says so. Now what is that law? That is the internal law. And this conflict of law, that is law of the, of the sovereign and the law of the eternity, that is the divine law or law of nature, this gave rise to a conflict. In the, as early as in the fifth, fifth century, Sokoflis is, is giving us uh, two ideas of law. A law, imperative law, and the other law is coming from the law as it should be, from the idea of rightness and justice. Recognized by the sovereign, recognized, not made by the sovereign. That is what we know as Mesopotamia. There flourished a very rich uh, system of law. And we are told by the code of Hammurabi that it really existed and it even reached to us. So those persons who were responsible for this bright code are not supposed to be ashamed of because the, Mr. Hitler says it is wrong, it is shameful to be a lawyer because they are still celebrated as the pioneer of legal thinking. We owe our original thinking from that code. Now we, we travel to, to Greece. In some occasions, they used to hire some person, they were called orators. They could not take any fee, nor it was their profession. Nonetheless, they used to help them. They were experts in law, and they used to uh, help the neighbors in, the, in fighting out the cause of justice. Now, before that, the, or till then, the law was a fusion of three things. That is, law itself, religion, and morals. 
it was a fusion of three. Now, anybody who used to help them had, had to have knowledge of all the three branches of law, religion, and morals. To be an orator, worthy of, or capable of helping somebody, he had, the, he had to have the, that knowledge of all the three branches. Now, in Iliad, we find one such sin. In the whole Iliad, there is only one difference of a case. Even the days of Iliad, it was the people who said, what judgment is to be accepted and what not. But we do not find any argument of any lawyer there. Now, therefore, we have to come to Rome. The Romans, it is said that we don't know who is the father of law, but we definitely know who is the mother. The mother is Rome. And this is because the first written the evidence of existence of a law, it is short, something less than a code, but it is more important than a code because of its originality. And I am speaking of the 12 tables. Two persons, the delegation, to, to Greece to study the code of Ceylon. Ceylon, you know, he's flourished in 6, 3rd and, and 38, something like that, in, in Greece in Greece, in Athens, and he gave some quotes. And they felt interested, Rome felt interested about one thing. His, his one quotation is very famous throughout the world. He says, the essence of democracy is not obeying any master but law. I repeat, essence of democracy is not obeying any master what law? So that great man, he influenced table, table, 12 tables. After 12 tables, we know the, the development, the evolution of law. And l lastly, we come across the code of Justinian, which also influenced the subsequent um, in law. In between, there is a great scholar of law, Cesaro. Cesario, he is uh, one, one, one writing, one book is still studied in, in, in Harvard as one of the textbook, Cesaro's writings. And he is still celebrated in America as the original source of law. So Cesaro, you know, during the time of uh, Julius Caesar, he was uh, pursued to be a, one of the, um, the minister. He refused and he had to escape to Greece. Anyway, Caesar's writings are still available to enrich the law and it is being studied. Now Justinian's code is what is still available and it, it is his digest and his institutes are very much the source of original law. But throughout this period, we find the, the bar as we know today was exactly not there. Originally, the, it, is, it was the Jewish consults who used to advise the priests and, and kings on the matters of law. And they were replaced by uh, the universities. Law universities started in Rome and, and Constantinople and Baptist, three places. They started universities to study law. Therefore, they, they were withdrawn. They were not there, Jewish concerns. Another type of the lawyers, they were orators. And they used to advise the legal um, litigants about their cases before the courts. Now these orators were converted into advocates. They were the actual lawyers. And during the time of Claudius, it was permitted to take fee from the clients. So it was the later part of the Roman Empire that during the time of Claudius, that we know that lawyers as a class emerged. And they used to get fees, and it was permitted by legislation to take fees. There was a, a, a criteria in the front. Up to this, you can extract from the client, not beyond. So the, after the fall of the Roman Empire, again, there is a big, long, big, um, and you know, the English history, 
about the law and it is said that only during the time of Edward the First, the law as organized practice emerged. The bar was born, as I have started saying, Mr. Knight quoting that bar was born in the year 1291 when he ordered, the king ordered that his uh, counsel to arrange a list of some experts in law. They enlist some persons whom you know to be the expert of law and only they will appear in my courts and no other. So that became the, the starting of the monopoly of 1291. For a digression, let me come to Bangla Bengal. What was the position in Bengal before 1291? You know, Muslim rule came in Bengal, in bar was established, the courts of Qajis were established, and Sharia law, which came along with the Muslim rule, they started functioning. And that was a very rich, was the complainant. And the case was that when the, the Sultan was practicing archery, one arrow accidentally hit the son of the lady. And the lady came before the court of Qazi, complaining against the Sultan, and the Sultan summoned the Sultan. The Qazi summoned the Sultan. Sultan was found guilty and he obeyed the judgment of the of the Qazi by giving the compensation as permitted by the law of the land that they are. So if you think of that, the, 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 the supremacy of law, rule of law in Bengal in the beginning of the 13th century when England was still in confusion as to the supremacy of law, they are fighting. And even before 1215, the day, the day of Magna Carta, there was virtually nothing called right of the people. All obligation, no right. So it is the barons who fought for the rights, for their interest, and the other people, they only supported them for their interest. Nonetheless, it was in a confusion, and there was no system like this. How to prove a case before the court, a criminal trial? The system was the trial by ordeal, that is, the court is to summon a priest from the church. Priest comes to the court and the accused is brought before him and the priest will give him, say, a barn, a, 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 a iron barn on some portion of the body. And court says, go home, come after, th after three days. If the barn is healed within three days, the man is acquitted. If it does not, he was found guilty. But in Bengal, and we also know, had to know their law as well. Now, thereafter, this is the digression. Now, this, after a word, what happened? They, thereafter, long, it is a long story, and you know the story is how the hints of courts were started, and, and um, you better know than myself, they, their struggle and their sufferings. And now those attorneys, they, not attorneys, they, they were called sergeants at law. We call sergeant at arms. Those, they were called sergeants at law. They studied law in those inns. Attorneys also start law. And ultimately it emerged that in the 13th century, when the court of chancery started. There, a, a group of lawyers emerged. They were uh, the real uh, advocates appearing before the court. And the attorneys, they used to draft and help the, the lawyer. They, they were called, the, those part of the surge, group of sergeants, they were called barristers. And others, non barristers those became uh, the attorneys the solicitors group. And uh, in the beginning of 17th century, it was made very rigid that only the barristers will appear before the court, and all non barristers are the solicitors. And now, th that is the, the position, and 
in our country we had we had all the advocates the lawyers are advocates in the bar council and by that we follow the original that is the advocates the orators advocates and we follow not england but rome that is the original now what is the position in america in america we know the they were taught law by one gentleman not in person by through his writings that is the that is the uh, what is that the common law written by the great lawyer that is blackstone and those books were created by the english to the other part of the atlantic and studying those books they became lawyer no no school nothing of the sort they the generally there was a view against the lawyers you know we don't need lawyers but ultimately it so happened that they needed lawyer and the declaration of independence uh, independence the constitution and the subsequent congress all lawyer dominated by lawyers and lawyers only you uh, know the declaration of independence came from the brief of lawyer and the out of the 13 countries uh, representatives the most of them were lawyers and even today the congress is dominated by the lawyers two third members of the congress are lawyers now in uh, it is the law that made what the america is today because of the lawyers and when i came here we st we started discussing about dred scott that infamous case argued and decided as early as in 1854 the year is very significant compared to the 1954 brown and board of education in 1854 the law said dred scott is not a person in the mid in the mid time they said no the blacks and whites are separate but equal now in 1954 it came from the brief of a lawyer they thought that if america is to survive it must survive in unity not in bifurcation black america and white america and when the, this came case came he decided it saying that no there shall be no longer any segregation and you know when the judgment came from the court in the nimbus judgment for the first time the, the 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 president was eisenhower he was playing golf somebody reported that here is a judgment from the court he said oh the chief justice gave the judgment what that judgment made and you know the the, the reward of the judgment in 1974 9th of july that gentleman died what is justice all were and died his dead body was taken to the supreme court of america and there is a room in the inside the supreme court that is called rotenda rotenda in the, there is the rotenda in the house of commons i saw it rotenda is a place where you can there is the wall but you can see the sky because there is no uh, no ceiling ha <laughs> the roof so that body was brought there and everybody was going to pay he is or her homage to the great man a reporter went there and suddenly he noticed that a a cleaner a sweeper we call sweeper they call cleaner from across the road that is the capitol she has come with flowers uh, to t pay her tribute to this great judge It, he became curious he went to the the cleaner and said what brought you here what business you had with this judge the annoyed cleaner said gentlemen america is a it is better place to live because he lived so i i should add that he should have said because he lived and a man like for good marshall lived from whose brain this idea of unsoundness of that judgment separate but equal came so it is the brief of a lawyer could civilize them made them what they are now in the 
in the context of our situation, we are fighting very hard for the establishment of the rule of law. And I am told that this organization is devoted to that spirit of studying law and to make law our master. As Salon said, that obey only one master and that should be the law. And we are looking for those days to come when we shall have no other master than the law as a master. That is the rule of law. And we have a great heritage of that history where law was the supreme ruler, not the sultan or the king. Now, about the profession, I, since I had been in the profession, I should say something about this great profession. This great profession uh, gave birth to so many examples because of the time constraint probably I cannot mention all the incidents of this supremacy of law and the bar. During that period of struggle in the American independence struggle, a man emerged, the greatest political thinker of 18th century, Thomas Paine. So he was accused of sedition, seditious, seditious libel in England. The case started because of his book, Rights of Man. Two books, The Common Sense and The Rights of Man. He, the case was for his writing and publishing that book, Rights of Man. He accused both um, George the First and James and the, and the George the First. George and James they was probably. So in the, when the case uh, started, came before the court, Mr. Payne did not get any, any, any lawyer. No lawyer, because it is so bad to say something against the king and uh, to identify himself with that sort of clients. So how come that he should not get any lawyer? I will take up his brief and defend him. And he defended Mr. Speech about the, the law and legal profession. And it is a memorable the rule of law, the end of the all the bellows the English civilization stands for. And th that brilliant speech was, was, uh, was honored by the English society. Uh, subsequently, this man lost his job and subsequently he was rewarded. He was the attorney general. Now, the Prince of Wales made him the Lord Chancellor. So he was ultimately, he was rewarded for his courage. So I am telling you this story because to be a lawyer, the first thing you require is courage. This, it is a courage which is needed to support the cause of your client and also to support the cause of justice and truth. Now, there was a saying by no other, a person no other than Cockburn, Chief Justice Cockburn. He said that he, yes, a lawyer is, is, to, is, to, is, to, is to defend his client's cause and because he is the immediate employer, but nonetheless his ultimate employer is the truth and justice. And there, is, there should be a conciliation between the two duties. He has a duty to the, to the client he has a duty to the court, and court represents truth and justice. So this conciliation between the two interests will give birth to the rule of law, and the, the supremacy of this rule of law depends on the emergence of truth and justice. Now, coming to the other giant in law is Justice Denning, who said a lawyer must be true to himself, he true to his client, he is, must be true to the court. That is the truth and justice. So he has three obligations, to be true to his client, true to the court, 
true to him, above all true to himself. So when you are arguing a case, think that well, are you true to yourself? That is the last criterion to be an honest lawyer. There is a um, saying like this honest, about honesty of lawyer. It was it so happened that Abraham Lincoln was visiting a uh, what is that a, a national uh, what is called national graveyard so near Arlington. not Arlington in Virginia some part of Virginia I forgot the name and he was shown that here li here lies now nah, this the epitaph was like this here lies a lawyer and honest man then <laughs> he smiled Lincoln smiled and said I didn't think that situation was so bad they had they had to bury um, they had to uh, they had to select one uh, two graves for the not one grave for the two persons <laughs> so our situation is not that bad that we had to uh, think that a man cannot be a lawyer and honest at the same time because in our country we gave birth to great lawyers in the in the past and there are great lawyers even today and the nation can very much depend on their intelligence and learning to, for guidance now there are um, it is said that in, in this part of the world that in India a uh, what is called a what is that um, untouchable uh, untouchable gave them the law that is I, I refer to Dr. Ambedkar he was a lawyer and when he was approached to draft their constitution he said you will come to an un un untouchable for law so, so the fact remains that it is he here we have got a constitution from some lawyers headed by no other person than our Dr. Kamal Hussain. We are proud of him. And <coughs> we have so many things in the recent past about the courage, as I have said, of a lawyer. You know that and the story about that uh, Estesham's case, probably it was being argued in the case of Shahbuddin, Justice Shahbuddin, and another judge. I, I was sitting in there. Then the court was was not hearing what Mr. Kandakar was trying to to emphasize. And he was angry and he said, it is better to go and plow the land. <laughs> he was saying. The another day I was in the court when um, Mr. Hamidullah Choudhury was, he stood up suddenly and he said, my Lord, uh, Kamaluddin was, Kamaluddin Hussain was presiding. said, the order should be like this, not like this. And it annoyed the Chief Justice and he said, are you dictating the court? Annoyed Mr. Choudhury, he said, no, the bar is meant for, uh, for correcting the court. I am just correcting your Lord. So bar is there to correct the court. Yes. And the, the reach the bar, the richer is the, the, the bench. And if the bar is poor, timid, then the, the judges will be timid and that will be not learned. And about the learned, there is a joke like this. They, we say our brothers are ju our learned brothers. And uh, we, we call our judges, my lords, like this. We address the, the subordinate judiciary as your honor, something like that. In one tribunal, Mr. Hussain Sarwardi was appointed as a defense lawyer. Probably Major Akbar's case, probably. The, 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 the rebellion. Then the other side was represented by the Mr. Naziruddin, somebody from West Pakistan, not our Naziruddin. Not Khatmahadu Naziruddin, another Naziruddin. Then the Mr. Sarwardi was addressing the, the judges, the chairman and the member as my lords, my lords. He stood up. Naziruddin stood up and said, Your Honor, or members of the tribunal, 
Minister Sarodi is trying to eulogize the, co the, co the, the tribunal by repeatedly saying, my lord, my lord, knowing full well that you are not entitled to address as such. The witty, the other part is the witty. Wit wit is another weapon of the lawyers. The, the witty Sarodi stood up and said, Mr. Chairman of the tribunal, we say many things we don't mean. <laughs> when I, I have said so because of my long practice in the higher courts, but uh, when I said my learned brother Naziruddin, I never meant he is my brother or learned. <laughs> so this is the, the witty, the wit of a lawyer. So a lawyer must be very much witty. And there is a story of Irish bar about the wits. The lawyers are not supposed to uh, use arms against another brother. They are to use their wit and learning against the other brother. And the story goes like this. In Irish bar, there are two lawyers. One tall, with a giant. And the other was very short. The, when the tall was arguing, and the arguing all nonsense, the short one was, was disturbing. And the annoyed tall said, if you go on disturbing like this, I'll put you in my pocket. <laughs> annoyed short stood up and retorted, in that case, you will have more law in your pocket than you ever had in your head. <laughs> so this is all about, about wits. The, the witty, witty lawyers. And about the honesty, a, law, a lawyer has say he, he should be honest as well, and he must be honest to himself, to the client. And it is, the story is like this, in Calcutta Bar, after the High Court was, was uh, there, a, a rich man hired all the senior lawyers to support his case. And the last one, he was also a good lawyer, he was approached. He refused. No, I will not sign your power. And he said, why? I will give them the double the payment I made to the other one. Why you should remain? I must, you must be in the list. He said, at least there should be one available for the poor. That is, I, I am not purchasable. That is, bar should remain unpurchasable, not purchasable by the bunny. There should be some lawyers to support the case of the poor. Here comes again the spirit of public service. If there is no public service, it is it is ceased to be a profession, it becomes a business. Now about the courts, uh, about the lawyers, there is one book. Not about the lawyer, it is about the Supreme Court. The name of the book is The Supreme Court of US. That is written by no other than the Chief Justice and Enquest. I was discussing about Enquest in the morning. And he has categorized four types of lawyers in the book. Am I short of time? The four types of lawyer, because of his experience, both as a clerk to the judge and as a sitting judge and the ultimately a Chief Justice. His experience is, there are four types of lawyers in the book. He experienced. The first type of is rector. No, lector. L-E-C-T-O-R, lector. The lector is, what is the lector? He comes to the court. He reads his brief from the beginning to the end, not looking to the court at all. And he, he then he reads his written arguments or points, not including to the eyes of the judges, all by himself. And he ends, he sits, as if saying, this is the end of the lesson today. He comes to the court for giving lesson. This is the end of the lesson for today. This is lector. The other kind of the lawyers is, 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 is um, he is he's debating champion. That class is debating champion. He is very conversant with his case. 
he does not hear what the court says, doesn't say, he does not entertain any question. He goes on at point after point, he is arguing all the time. He does not look to anybody, this and that. And at the end, uh, he finishes. And, the, and, the, and he, he thinks that, well, I have given 10 points, definitely I'll win the case. No matter whether he's, he has tried to convince the judge or not, he had no concern. So that is the second type of lawyers, that they are giving points after point. You can locate some type of lawyers in the bar. I remember a few names. Some are dead, some are living. I cannot name them because they belong to that group that more points, it is prospect of good judgment. That is not the case. Case is whether the court is convinced about the point. Uh, these are the, you wrote the book yourself mm -hmm. about the, it is a big, long narration. He has given his reasons to categorize them as the debating champions. The third type is Casey Joan. Casey Joan is very much uh, fluent in his submission. He is not reading the brief at all. He is prepared, no, no preparation in the court from the brief. He has all the points in his uh, command and he's giving them one after another. Uh, but ultimately, he, he does not stop anywhere. He, had the, uh, he, he is not summarizing anything. He comes to the end and at the end, the court, one of the judge will observe that boy, he knows law. But the other judge will smile and say, we are not satisfied. Yes, he, 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 he tried to show that he knows law, he knows something of the case, but never bothered whether he could convey anything to the bench. So that is the third category, Casey Jones. And the last category he mentions about the spellbinder. And you can locate them, them in our bar as well, and in any, like any other bar. They are spellbinding. They will pick up some points. They are very much uh, expert or in their formulation of law points. And they have a good voice. And they have mastery of our language. And they have chosen, they have chosen some points according to him of, of very much importance. Not bothering whether any other point is possible that may be disturbing the judge. But he will beautifully place those points by a wonderful voice and narration of the facts, master of facts. But judge will still think that, well, why he is not addressing that point? Some point is left out. So he, this category is a spellbinder. Now, while addressing a similar gathering in, in the Brock University, I made an addition, said that a good lawyer is the combination of Casey Jones and Spellbinder. If there is a combination that last two in one lawyer, he is the best lawyer. He has the Spellbinding capacity of the Spellbinder and at the same time the formulation of the law, understanding of law as the Casey Jones. But not one alone, the combination only can make him a good lawyer. Now, about the, about the rule of law again. In our country, we have gone through very troubling periods about this bar and the bench and the position of law as such. And when I, go, I was retiring in the, and the bar gave me reception, I said one thing. And I said, if the bar is divided in political line, this and that, then there is no strength of the bar at all. You cannot imp impress upon the court. So when you come to the court, there should be one, one class only 
your lawyers. Forget about your, your background, political background. Leave it behind. And if bar is united as a whole, it can impress upon both the judges and upon the, upon the other, other organs of the state. The um, struggle between the, between the, what is that? The House of, uh, House of York and House of Lancaster. Hmm. So, history visited them, isn't it? England witnessed that struggle in the, after say, Edward the First, uh, along that period, and we know that history. But even in the midst of those bad days of struggle between the, the, uh, the, the Yorkists and the, what is that? The Lancaster. Something very valuable emerged. The parliament emerged, the bar emerged, and we know about that history. So why not here? We can also forget about the political fight. We can culture law. We can nourish law. As these gentlemen, whom I have congratulated at the beginning, they have started. We can have a future. We can have a good war. That will, that will be the source of our inspiration. That will be the guide of the nation. That will be the lo legal and natural guardian of the people. The legal lawyers are called the, uh, the natural guardian of the public. Let them be. And why there's that division? So think about that and you bring someone as the third lecturer here who can impress upon us about the importance of that unity in the bar. And if I live to see that day when the bar is united again once again, like 90s, after 90s, we can have a better days. And uh, Mr. Ali has left and in the morning he was saying, yes, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah la kulli hal. I said, how you are? He said, Alhamdulillah la kulli hal. Yes, we are, we are accepting the time, but we are not saying that time should stand still. It must be progressing. It must be on march of progress, not like a stagnant pool. So you lawyers, my brothers in the profession, you have nothing to worry now because history has not started only in, say, 1971, nor it has ended in 71 or 72. It is a beginning, and this few years is very insignificant time we can look forward for better days for the law and lawyers, bar and the benches. And uh, thank you all again, hoping for that bright and beautiful day in future. Thank you. The thing that I will take away from today's lecture is the fact that those of us who have joined the legal profession, we should be conscious and aware that we are in a profession whose traditions, whose values are rooted in antiquity. And it is up to us to live up to those values. I also would like to remark upon something in particular that he said. One of the things that I like to do personally is to draw connections between ourselves and those of us, those who have come before us. And one of the connections that we can draw, even those of us who are present over here, is uh, the connection with uh, a, main, a name that my Lord, Mr. Justice Mutin mentioned during the course of his lecture, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was the lawyer who had represented the, uh, the plaintiff in the case of 1954 Rice versus Board of education. Thurgood Marshall subsequently was made a judge of the Court of Appeal in 1961, the English, uh, the um, American Co Federal Court of Appeal. In 1961, he was made a judge of the Court of Appeal by, upon the nomination of John F. Kennedy, who was the President of the United States of America at that time. Now, the center at which this particular lecture is being held 
is named after his brother, EMK Center, Edward Kennedy, who was a senator. Uh, lastly, when he passed away, he was a senator and who was a great friend of Bangladesh in 1971. All of you are aware that in 1971, uh, the American government was very ambivalent in its at stance to the independence of Bangladesh, but that was in stark contrast to the popular opinion in the United States of America, which was very much supportive of what we were doing in 1971 uh, to our struggle for independence. And one of the voices in the American polity which spoke on behalf of a lot of the younger members of the profession, and this, what I'm about to say is abroad, and all of you are eager to make a positive contribution to the bar. A lot of you have set up your own chambers. And setting up your own chamber is a very challenging endeavor because you have to meet your overheads, you have to pay your rents, and every month, at the end of the month, there is a bill to pay. And for that reason, the profession has become a bit competitive, a bit cutthroat at a certain level. And a lot of us lawyers sometimes go out of our way to you come to regret it. I will give you a small example. This is a case that I'm presently doing. A particular young lawyer, uh, he's no longer young, but say about 20 years ago, when he set up his corporate practice independently, in order to accommodate the request of a foreign client, he, the foreign client wanted to incorporate a bang, company in Bangladesh. At that point of time, the foreign client did not have any counterparts. So he ended up offering himself as a subscriber to the Memorandum and Articles of Association. The company was incorporated. Soon thereafter, the client came to him. The client was a very uh, clever person, as you will soon discover. He was from Holland. So when the client came to him after the company was incorporated and said that we have to take a loan from the bank for the purposes of the, for our business. Since you are now a shareholder and director of this company, you will have to give a guarantee. So he gave a personal guarantee. That was the last that he had heard of this client. Sooner he, uh, uh, one day the client turned up and uh, obtained a share transfer instrument and obtained his signatures as resigning as a director of the company, but that was the last that he heard of the company, uh, of that particular client, until 15 or 16 years later, when he received a summons issued in an execution case in an Arthurian Adalot case. What had happened, unbeknown to him, the client actually took money from the bank, left the country, and the bank had proceeded ex parte against him, obtained a decree, he did not have summons of the case. And subsequently, when the case was finally put to execution, he received a summons attaching his property in execution. Well, the case is now in the High Court Division. Uh, on behalf of that particular client, I have filed a writ petition, obtained a rule and stayed. The rule is awaiting hearing, taking advantage of a procedural flaw in the execution case, which I hope will uh, help me get him off the hook. But this is a, I, I mentioned this as a cautionary tale that those of you who are young, who are setting up your independent practices, should always maintain a sense of detachment and objectivity. And of course, you should also live up to the values that has been so effectively and wonderfully narrated and articulated by my Lord Mr. Justice M. M. Muthi. You should be honest to yourself, you should be honest to the brief, you should be honest to the court. And until and unless you develop your integrity, you yourself will not progress much in your career. Remember another thing, and this is also something that I am reflecting upon from personal experience. You may endeavor, uh, you may dedicate yourself fully to the profession, and by brick by brick, by calloused hand by calloused hand, you may develop a reputation in the, in, in the profession, develop a relationship with the court where the court plays, uh, lays great emphasis in what you say and also relies upon your submissions. But if you err only once, then that may shatter your reputation forever. So be very careful about uh, these pitfalls that may come in. And in your desperation to succeed in your practices, do not succumb to various requests that clients would make from time to time. So uh, before, I uh, before I conclude, uh, it remains for me to thank the brilliant team of Think Legal once more.
today only Anita is here and along with her colleagues, but Sakib is missing. But nonetheless, I, I, the, there are the others as well. So I would like to express my gratitude to them for uh, organizing this lecture. And finally, once more, thank you very much, my Lord Mr. Justice M. A. Mateen, for your very illuminating lecture. And we hope to see similar contributions from senior members of the bar. Much obliged.